It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you. Good morning, Speaker. This question is for the Premier. People have a right to know what their government is doing on their behalf and with their tax dollars. It's why we have strict rules around things like government communications and record keeping. It's why emails of senior government officials are subject to freedom of information laws. But this government and this premier don't seem to think that that kind of transparency matter. And we've seen a disturbing pattern of government members and senior staff using their personal accounts for government business. On Friday, the Premier himself confirmed that his chief of staff regularly uses his personal email for government business. So my question is, why? I've, I've, uh, I've answered this question a number of times for the Leader of the Opposition. If the, the Leader has additional information or any information whatsoever that she'd like to provide uh, uh, to the Commissioner, I encourage her uh, to do so, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Uh, I and members of this government were not uh, investigators, although we do have many uh, former police officers amongst our ranks. Uh, that is not our job, Mr. Speaker. So if she wants to raise those issues, I encourage her, as opposed to bringing it up here in the legislature, she could provide that information to the commissioner and allow the commissioner to do the job that we as a legislature empower him to do. The supplementary question. I'll, I'll just repeat my question. My question to the Premier was why? Let me, let me try to tell you why. Because there's only one reason why this government would repeatedly be using personal emails to avoid detection. These aren't just emails about upcoming staff meetings. We are talking about major government decisions that impact the public. We're talking about the Green Belt. We're talking about secret meetings. We're talking about code words. Right? Government business that was being done on massage tables in Vegas. They did everything they could Order. to cover their tracks. And now the Premier himself is doubling down. He's saying his chief of staff did nothing wrong when he repeatedly gave Order. false testimony to the integrity commissioner. So does the Premier think he or his chief of staff are above the law? Again, Mr. Speaker, it's the drive-by smear from the NDP. They have no relevance. They have Order. no relevance in this place at all. It is, it is obvious that the people of Ontario uh, have uh, overlooked the NDP and have completely forgotten about them as, a, as an effective opposition party, Mr. Speaker. The evidence of that, of course, is the fact that in the last uh, two by-elections, other received more votes than the, uh, the NDP. They have absolutely no policies when it comes to the economy. They understand that their continuing support of the federal Liberal Party Party that supports a carbon tax puts them offside Order. of the Canadian people, Mr. Speaker, including the people of Ontario who have said loud and clear that they do not want a carbon tax, that it is harming them. So Order. they're offside on that. They're offside on law and order, Mr. Speaker. This is a party uh, that opposes the uh, the police at every step of the way, Mr. Speaker. They're offside on the infrastructure funding that order. we're doing in place. Mr. Speaker. They're offside on the for reforms that we're doing in the education system. They are a party that is increasingly irrelevant to the people. Order. Final supplementary. Speaker, you know when you're getting close to the truth because you get a desperate response like that. That's the truth. Oh, multiple independent officers of the legislature have warned this government about avoiding disclosure rules. Explosive reports from the Auditor General, the Integrity Commissioner, the Information and Privacy Commissioner, and RCMP criminal investigation underway into this government. It all shows the same thing. This is a government that wasn't just deleting emails related to the Green Belt. They were also using their personal emails to avoid detection. The Premier himself conducts his bu government business on his personal devices and refuses to disclose the details of those phone records to the public, even though it's required by law. When the Liberal government got caught covering up their gas plant uh, scandal, you know what happened? Someone went to jail. Why is the Premier Order. following the Liberals down the same path of code words, cover-up and criminal investigations. Members will take their seat. Member for Brampton North, come to order. The member for Renfrew-Nipissing-Pembroke, come to order. Government House Leader may reply. You know, when, 
when the Liberals, of course, broke the law and somebody went to jail, it was the NDP who quickly stood up and supported them to maintain them in, in office, Mr. Speaker. That's actually what happened. Now, colleagues, I don't know about you. I don't feel very desperate. I don't feel very desperate. I'm actually happy. I'm happy because we have a government that is moving in the right direction for the people of the province of Ontario. Out of the ashes of the Liberal and NDP coalition that put this province in the ground, what are we doing? We're investing in health care. We're investing in infrastructure. We're investing in hospitals in all parts of the province. And you know who agrees with us, Mr. Speaker? The people of the province of Ontario who elected two progressive conservatives in two by-elections, Mr. Speaker, while at the same time sending a message Response. to the Leader of the Opposition that they prefer other than they do the Leader and the NDP, Mr. Speaker. The member for Hamilton Mountain come to order. The member for Waterloo come to order. Leader of the Opposition, next question. Thank you, Speaker. This year, we see that wildfires are already up from this time last year. Last year was one of the worst fire seasons on record. So far this year, there have already Order. been 94, four fires just this week. But inexplicably, the budget to fight those wildfires is down 37.5%. And you know what, Speaker? While they, while they blather away over there, I'm talking about an issue that is going to affect many, many, many people in many communities across this province, so they should be listening. Wildfires are going up. Money Order. to fight wildfires is going down. So my question to the Premier is, can the Premier tell us how that makes any sense at all? Order. Government House Leader. Speaker, you can't make this up. Like I have offered to cross the floor once in a while and write questions for the NDP so that they could do better. So that they could do better. But I can't read budgets for them. I assume they do that. The Minister of Natural Resources has actually increased funding to fight forest fires by 92 percent. 92 percent, colleagues. That is what we've increased the budget to fight wildfires. Now, of course, Liberal and NDP math would suggest that a 92 percent increase is actually a, a decrease, Mr. Speaker. But you know what the good news is? The good news is that we're making those investments. The bad news for the people of the province of Ontario is that these two opposition parties, both irrelevant to the people of the province of Ontario, but the NDP historically irrelevant, they always vote against Response. all of these. Now, she just called me a mad dog. You know what I am? I'm a dog on a bone because I want better for the people of the province of Ontario. come to order. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Speaker, the government can shrug off of these concerns, but the fires are still coming. The concerns are coming from an increasing number of townships and cities from First Nations that have been evacuated in previous years, and some are already being evacuated now, especially in northwestern Ontario. It's coming from farming communities where they have to contend with poorer <coughs> air quality, uh, with less productive days. And importantly, it's coming from the frontline wildland firefighters themselves. They're worried that they may not have the fire crews that they need this season. So I'm going to ask the Premier, who's sitting in his seat right now, if he could stand up, answer this question. Can he explain why he thinks this is enough when those who fight the fires are telling you it's not? I'm going to ask the Leader of the Opposition to withdraw her unparliamentary remark. Withdraw. Order. Order. Government House Leader may reply. Well, Speaker, it is precisely because of the seriousness by which we take this that we have increased funding by 92% to fight those fires, Mr. Speaker. 
Now, we have done that in every community across the province of Ontario. And we're not doing it in isolation. We work, of course, with the Minister of, uh, of Northern Development to help us highlight some of those areas. We work with the Solicitor General, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that in many of the communities that did not have fire protection before, that they actually have fire protection, Mr. Speaker, and some of the unincorporated areas so that they could actually participate in this. We made the investments, Mr. Speaker. Imagine that when we came to office, this sector was so underfunded by the previous Liberal and NDP coalition government across the province of Ontario that we've had to increase it by 92 percent. Now, of course, the Leader of the Opposition and the Liberals voted against those increases because you know what happens. When the Question. camera is on, they say Response. one thing, but when the camera turns off, they do something completely different. We're consistent. We're always there for the people of the province. I believe this is the final supplement. Thank you, Speaker. Consistent, consistently underfunding, cutting, leaving people desperate and alone with fire, 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 fire season before them. Speaker, we are down as many as 200 firefighters in Ontario. That's the truth. With as many as 40 wildland firefighters being laid off just since May. That's the truth. Fires are raging right now. That's the truth. And this government hasn't backed up those firefighters with the resources that they need to keep people safe and communities safe while fires are raging in this province. It is time to do right by the firefighters, and I want to be very specific with my question to the Premier. Will the Premier assure Ontarians that there will be fully staffed crews and planes for every single region that needs it? Members, please take your seat. The government House Leader. Again, Mr. Speaker, that is why the Minister of Natural Resources has brought forward a plan that saw an increase in funding of 92 Order. percent, Mr. Speaker. That is why the Solicitor General brought forward a program to ensure that we have fire services in unincorporated areas so that they could participate on both occasions. The NDP and the Liberals voted against those supports. We've increased uh, support for new technologies by over $20 million. In fact, Ontario is such a valued partner that we are called upon to participate and to assist other provinces and internationally whenever we can, Mr. Speaker. That speaks to the professionalism of Ontario's fire crews, Mr. Speaker. It speaks to the investments that we have made, Mr. Speaker, and it speaks to why, again, the NDP and the Liberals have become so Response. irrelevant in the province of Ontario, because for a decade and a half, they underfunded, and it took us to bring those resources so that we could fight fires, not only in Ontario, but around the world. Next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. The Deputy Premier just said it's raining, so I guess none of us have to worry. Boy, I tell you, that is the. You did. Anyways, this, this question is for the Premier. Porter. Porter. Grassy Narrows. Porter. Hansard caught it. Hansard caught it. She called it a lie. Secondly, as members are aware, um, unparliamentary language um, cannot be permitted. I'm going to ask the uh, Deputy Premier to withdraw her unparliamentary comment. In standing. I will withdraw my unparliamentary language, but this, the official opposition also. I'm going to ask the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health to withdraw without reservation or comment. Withdraw. I am. Okay. No. No. Minister of Northern Development and Minister of Indigenous Affairs will come to order. Minister of Health will please withdraw her unparliamentary comment. I withdraw. Thank you. Order. The member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry will come to order. The member for Mississauga, Malton will come to order. 
The Minister of Health will come to order. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition has the floor. Thank you, Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Grassy Narrows has been searching for justice for generations. They are living through one of Canada's worst environmental and human rights catastrophes. They are now suing Ontario and Canada. Judy De Silva, a grandmother from Grassy Narrows, has a simple ask, which I'm going to read out today to the government. She says this, stop poisoning us. Let us protect our land and our people, and we will be healthy again. So my question to the Premier is, will this government stop the ongoing poisoning of the people of Grassy Narrows today? The Minister, the Minister, will take your seat. The Minister of Northern Development and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Speaker, you know, the member opposite knows that one of the first actions we took upon forming government in 2018 was to actually index the mercury disability be benefits to inflation after not being increased for inflation since the inception of the Mercury Disability Fund. As a result, most beneficiaries saw their monthly pay payments nearly double, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Mercury Disabilities Fund Investment Fund was then replenished with over $127 million based on a triannual assessment that we received in June 2021. These funds will ensure that the Mercury Disability Fund is resourced to provide benefits to beneficiaries for many years to come. The next actuarial assessment is expected in June 2024. And in June 2022, the Mercury Disability marked the opening of its new clinical space in Kenora, along with the successful launch of reformed assessment clinics. Mr. Speaker, we're working with the community. Supplementary question. Speaker, perhaps the minister didn't hear my question. It is the responsibility of a government, surely, to ensure that the people are not being actively poisoned by the fish they eat or the water they drink. Right? The lawsuit uh, that we're talking about doesn't prevent anyone on the other side, the Premier or his Cabinet, from taking decisive action to stop the ongoing contamination of the river today, right. tomorrow, and every day after that. They are the government. They have the power to do the right thing right now. So back to the Premier. How can they knowingly allow this terrible poisoning to continue on their watch? Members, will please take their seats. Minister of Northern Development, and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Speaker, our, our world-class, our world-class resource development sector is matched only by their compliance, Mr. Speaker, to the highest environmental protection standards out there, Mr. The Speaker, world. and we enforce it. But in the situation of Grassy Narrows, Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier, we came onto this file in 2018. Even the former Premier of what is now the uh, uh, non-affiliate Liberals, or whatever they're called, Mr. Speaker, admitted to me that it was high time we took action, Mr. Speaker, but 2018, that's exactly what we did. We're taking good care of those uh, beneficiaries, Mr. Speaker, from Wab Simung and Grassy, First, uh, Grassy Narrows First Nations. The Mercury Disability Fund, uh, having been replenished, will ensure that all people currently on that registry, Mr. Speaker, are, are going to get the benefits that they deserve for those Spons. historical damages. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. People in my riding of Lampton, Kent, Middlesex and across the province are facing hard times. As this federal carbon tax continues to drive up the cost of living, families cannot afford ever-rising grocery and gas prices. Speaker, my constituents who rely on their cars for primary form of transportation are being punished with high fuel costs driven by this punitive tax. They need relief. The Governor of the Bank of Canada has stated that carbon tax contributes 15 per cent each year wow. upwards on inflation and that scrapping this tax altogether would lower inflation. It is clear to the, every Ontarian that this carbon tax is not helping them, it's not delivering the environmental gains the Liberals claim it would, and it's costing all of us. 
Speaker, can the minister please explain how, unlike the Liberals, our government is achieving our energy objectives without introducing a costly carbon tax? Speaker, I'm delighted to talk about our energy initiatives and how they're also helping the environment and keeping costs low in our province so we can see record investment in Ontario, the types that we have been seeing, multi-billion dollar investments. Now, we're announcing the development of new, clean, affordable, reliable energy generation, like our nuclear facilities in the clean energy capital in the Durham region, the first small modular reactor in the Western world, refurbishing the Pickering nuclear generating stations, continuing with refurbishment at Darlington and at Bruce, building out new nuclear power at Bruce as well, new clean energy storage, the largest procurement in Canadian history just happened a couple of weeks back, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to go back to the liberal ways of providing energy to our province, where electricity prices triple under their watch. Now, I heard the leader of the Green Party this morning saying he wanted to go back to the ways of the green energy. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. Order. Member for Lambton Kent Middlesex, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It's reassuring to see our government to continue uh, delivering affordable and fight the terrible carbon tax. As we roll out our real practical solutions to make Ontario's electricity grid not more than just affordable, but cleaner and more reliable. Speaker, our province boasts one of the cleanest electricity systems in the world. However, rather than bolstering our energy endeavors, our, the federal government prioritizes taking money from families by forcing them to pay a carbon tax. Their provincial buddies, led by the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, continue to prop up this failed tax policy. Speaker, it's time for the Liberals to face the reality and acknowledge that this tax only hurts the hardworking people of this province. My constituents in Lampton, Kent, Middlesex, and all other Ontarians want to see the end of this carbon tax today. Question. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how the government is fortifying Ontario's economy through our clean energy advantage without the use of carbon tax? Of energy. Speaker, while uh, the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, the leader of the Liberal Party, is ebullient in her support of Justin Trudeau's federal carbon tax, which is going up every April 1st, including last uh, month, with uh, two months ago, I guess now, with a whopping 23 per cent increase that is affecting the price of groceries and gas and home heating, as the member from Lambton Kent Middlesex mentioned. The Liberals and the Greens, their leadership was having a press conference this morning, and the NDP want to go back to the ways of the Green Energy Act, where we paid over market prices for energy and electricity generation in our province. We brought in a new way of doing business, Mr. Speaker. It's competitive procurements that's driving down the cost of energy in our province. Bills like Bill 165, keeping energy costs low, Mr. Speaker, is what our Premier and what our government believes in, and the result is massive, massive, multi-billion dollar investments in our Member will take a seat. Member will take a seat. The member for Beaches East York will come to order. The House will quieten down, please, so I can hear the member who is answering the question or posing the question. The next question, the member for Ottawa West, Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. Every parent's worst nightmare is receiving a phone call that something has happened to your child at school. On May 14, Landon Ferris's mother received that phone call. Landon was left alone at school despite having a seizure disorder and was found unresponsive. Landon should have come home safely to his mother that day. We want every child in Ontario to come home safely at the end of the day. But parents of children with special needs are warning that this could happen again if we don't address the funding shortfall and the lack of resources for special education. Will the Premier address that gap today and ensure that we are doing everything we can to protect our kids? Members will please take their seats. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. The loss of a child is indeed an unspeakable tragedy, and I believe all of us are 
deeply saddened by what has transpired at the Trenton High School, the loss of this young man. All of us express condolences to his family. Now, there is an active coroner's investigation, police investigation, and school board investigation into the circumstances of what led to this tragedy. And I would ask all of us to responsibly allow that process to carry forth with the commitment that the coroner will in in inevitably bring forth recommendations to learn from this and to ensure it never happens again. That is our obligation. It's the somber obligation we fulfill. We will fulfill for this child and every child in this province. Supplementary question. School boards are spending tens of millions of dollars more on special education than what they're getting from this government, and they still don't have the resources they need to keep our kids safe. Kids who should never be left alone are being left alone at school every single day in Ontario. We don't need to wait for the results of the investigation into Landon's death to take immediate steps to make children safer in our schools. We could properly invest in special education today and make sure that children have the caring, qualified adults around them that they need to stay safe. Will the Premier make that commitment today so that no one else receives this awful phone call? Minister of Education. The answer, Speaker, is yes. We will continue to make those investments. This year in special education, funding is up over $100 million when compared just to last year. There's 3,500 additional EAs supporting kids with exceptionalities. There's 9,000 additional education workers hired because of our funding. Mr. Speaker, we've increased the special education funding by over half a billion when compared to when we started in 2018. Now, we recognize there's more to do, which is why in Budget 2024 we increased in-class supports for children with ex exceptionalities for an additional $10 million. We announced more funding for students with disabilities to pursue cooperative education, more training of our staff. It would be irresponsible to draw conclusions at this point on what transpired, but be assured, we take this seriously. Order. We'll continue to invest, continue to hire, continue to do everything humanly possible Response. to ensure the safety of children within our care. Thank you, Speaker. The member from Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Residents in my riding of Mississauga Lakeshore and across the province are seeing the devastation impact of the federal carbon tax. Families are cancelling their summer vacation plans because they cannot afford the high fuel costs and small businesses are stretching every dollar on a tight budget. Speaker, it is concerning that the NDP and Liberal members in this House are choosing to ignore the hardship people in our province are facing as a result of this carbon tax. As our government works to build a healthy future for Ontarians, we are also continuing our efforts to fight against this regressive Liberal carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is strengthening Ontario's environmental protection without imposing a costly carbon tax? To reply, the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Speaker, Speaker the member is absolutely right. At a time when families are trying to get a little relief to enjoy their summer with their kids and their family, now is not the time for our job-killing carbon tax. The carbon tax has proven that it is a tax policy, it is not an environment policy, but, Speaker, under the leadership of this Premier, we've been able to prove that we can protect the environment, grow the economy and create good-paying jobs without a carbon tax. Speaker, we're working with industry, not against industry. For example, take green steel in Hamilton and Sault Ste. Marie. We're creating electric vehicles made here in Ontario, creating high-paying jobs while using our green steel. Instead, Speaker, the Liberals with carbon crombie would drive manufacturing jobs, and we've seen it, 300 manufacturing jobs out of this province. But instead, Speaker, our government is balancing the environment while creating good-paying jobs and creating the right economy that will spur economic growth. Thank you. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. Under the leadership of this premier and this government, we are creating jobs and economic growth right across this whole province. But, Speaker, the carbon tax undermines this progress, and it, asks, it raises the cost of living. At a time when many people are struggling to make ends meet, the 23 per cent increase to the carbon tax has only made things worse. Speaker, the Liberals haven't met a tax they don't like, and that's why they are 
reaching, these hand, oh, reaching their hands deep into our pockets. The federal government must scrap this costly tax that does nothing to protect the environment. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how our government is keeping costs down while preserving the health of our environment? Mr. The Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Speaker. Just look to our great transit project. Not only are we building more transit projects, but we've reduced one fare, making transit more affordable for Ontario families so they can discover Ontario this summer. And if they want to discover more of Ontario's beautiful parks, this is this government that's creating the first Ontario urban provincial park and creating new parks, something that hasn't been done in 40 years, Speaker. And you know what else is going to help those families get to discover their beautiful province is the 10 cents off of gas that we're giving them in relief. Speaker, those Ontarians can enjoy their summer in an affordable fashion. But if it was up to the Liberals and the opposition, they continue taxing Ontarians, making their summer holiday plans more expensive. But perhaps that's because Bonnie Crosby would rather go glamping in her Maserati, Speaker. Thank you. Next question, member for Thunder Bay Superior. Thank you, Speaker. In April, Premier Ford said, we're there to train the, retrain the workers, find them new opportunities, new jobs. But workers in Terrace Bay have still heard nothing. Quoting from a letter I heard, received this week, the government has forgotten the North and continues to give money to conglomerates with no accountability. Our families are being torn apart looking for work that doesn't exist. Premier, we need you to answer two questions. Is a deal for the mill imminent? And if not, what training will you provide for those with family responsibilities who cannot leave home for weeks at a time to work? The parliamentary assistant and member for Ajax. Speaker, this government is later focused on empowering our workers. We understand that workers need to be reskilled and retrained, and that is why we continue to invest in our workers, especially through our SDF funding. We have commit and continue to commit to supporting our workers to get in well-trained jobs as they move forward in their new positions. For, we continue to do pre-training pre programs that provide $28.3 million from 2022 to 2023 and $1.25 million in class, in, in class enhancement fund to support delivery of quality retraining programs. Supplementary question. Thank you. I, I did not hear an answer that uh, responded to the terrorist space situation, but I'll continue. Speaker, this government is failing to use all the tools at its disposal to keep people working at the Alstom plant in Thunder Bay. American manufacturing contracts must have at least 70 percent American content, yet you lowered local content rules to a mere 10 percent and gave the Ontario line to a Japanese corporation. Nine billion dollars paid by Ontario taxpayers with not one of the trains built in Ontario. We have the expertise, facilities, skilled workforce and supply chain. What we're missing is a commitment from this government to keep people in northwestern Ontario working. Premier, will you commit to the maximum possible local content in all future contracts? To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there has been no other Premier in the history of this province that has been committed to more Ontario jobs than this Premier. Over 700,000 more people working today because of Premier Ford and this government's policy, including building transit across this province. That member knows how many of those investments are supporting communities all across the north and a call all across this province. Thousands of workers employed because of this government's plan to build transit all across this province, Mr. Speaker. It's because of this Premier we're building in the north, whether it be the Ring of Fire, Highways 11 and 17, supporting transit workers in Thunder Bay. It's because of this Premier uh, we have over $40 billion worth of new foreign direct investment into this province. And because of this vision of this government, $70 billion are being invested into public transit to help support communities across the Thank you. 
The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you, Speaker. The government has been very busy over the last week defending their latest blunder, the billion-dollar booze boondoggle paid for by Ontario taxpayers. They could have waited about a year for the deal with the beer store to end. Instead, they keep the, tr the gravy train chugging along by wasting taxpayer dollars to cancel the deal today. While small businesses struggle, this government gives money out hand over fist to big box stores and for Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The member will take her seat. The House will come to order. Order. Start the clock. Member for Don Valley West. You know the last time small businesses got a tax break? In 2010, under an Ontario Liberal government. Speaker. Okay. Stop the clock. I cannot hear the member for Don Valley West. Okay, the warnings are starting. Next thing. Next time. The member for Kitchener, Conestoga, is warned. Start the clock. The member for Don Valley West has the floor. Speaker, this Premier has yet to keep two big promises, maybe because they don't relate to beer. A middle-income tax cut and a corporate tax cut. Both of those would help small businesses. My question to the Premier, will he help question. fix his broken promise today by passing Bill 195, the Cutting Taxes on Small Businesses Act? The Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, I don't know where to begin on this one. Mr. Speaker, if the member opposite had read some of the budgets passed by this House that her party voted against, she'd know that we cut the small business tax in our first mandate. She would know that we also accelerated the capital cost appreciation to help small business invest in capital. You know, it boggles the mind. In fact, boggle, boondoggle, you know, Mr. Speaker, the only way you can get to the Liberals' numbers on alcohol is if Bonnie Boondoggle increased taxes and increased fees, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this party is, this government, this party is reducing fees, reducing taxes, helping small businesses so they can compete across the province Bonds. and provide more consumer choice and convenience. Supplementary question. Speaker, I asked the government a simple question about a bill. It's too bad they won't answer it. Speaker, small business owners need help from this government. The CFIB wants Bill 195 passed. The Tourism Industry Association of Ontario wants Bill 195 passed. The CFIB has said that for every dollar spent at a local small business, 66 cents stays local versus with multinationals like some of those benefiting from the billion-dollar booze boondoggle where only 11 cents stays Order. in Ontario. Speaker, Order. Bill 195 is not complicated. It cuts the effective tax rate on small businesses in half from 3.2 per cent to 1.6 per cent and increases the income threshold for this deduction from $500,000 to $600,000. It will reduce taxes on small business by up to $17,900 a year. It will help them. So through you, Speaker, to the Premier, what will it be, yes or no, to helping Ontario small businesses by passing Bill 195? The Premier. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, let's start off with the CFIB, their, their quote about the alcohol. Speeding up the process will allow more Ontario small retailers to sell beer and wine is a very positive move for entrepreneurs and consumers. Mr. Speaker, it's, it's so positive 
For, for the economy, the small craft brewers are going to see an increase of $800 million to $1.2 billion more. This is creating over 7,500 new jobs that didn't exist before, compared to the Liberals that signed the worst contract I've ever seen in business in my entire life. It's all about taxation when it comes to their leader, Bonnie Crombie. That's all they believe in is taxing. We don't believe in taxing. We have never increased a tax in six years. We've decreased taxes. We've given money back to the people. We've given over eight billion dollars. take a seat. Members, please take their seat. The member for Ottawa South is warned. The member for Hamilton Mountain is warned. The member for Brampton North is warned. Start the clock. The next question. The member for Milton. Thank you, Speaker. The question is for the Minister of Energy. The federal carbon tax is a tax that farmers, small business owners, and Ontario families have repeatedly said no to. While our government continues to deliver measures to make life more affordable, Liberals and NDP fail to empathize with Ontarians who are struggling. They have no problem seeing this carbon tax triple over the next six years, Speaker, triple. While the cost of living is an all-time high, it is beyond disappointing to see opposition members fail to do the right thing and hold the federal government accountable. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House why the Liberals must stop playing politics and finally scrap the carbon tax once and for all? The Minister of Energy. To our amazing member from Milton, Mr. Speaker, it's, uh, it's great to be able to, to take on this question, especially in the moments after the last question from the Liberal member over there. Now, I know, I know a leopard can't change their spots, Mr. Speaker, and neither can a Liberal. The Liberals love to tax. Bonnie Crombie, the queen of the carbon tax, is happy to support Justin Trudeau's federal carbon tax, which is driving up the price for everyone in every business in Ontario. Anybody who gets anything trucked to them, Mr. Speaker, is paying more because of Justin Trudeau and Bonnie Crombie's carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. We're not in favour of a carbon tax. We've lowered taxes, we've lowered fees, we've cut red tape, and as a result, our economy is thriving with multi-billion dollar investments from Windsor to Umacore and Loyalist Township Response. and to the north, Mr. Speaker, and we're not done yet. A supplementary question, back to the member from Milton. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. Our government knows that we can build a growing economy, produce clean energy, and make the transition to Ontario build EVs without jeopardizing affordability for private people in this province. Unfortunately, the federal government is unwilling to listen to provincial leaders and Canadians on this topic. Speaker, when Bonnie Crombie was a federal leader, she was one of the first to support the carbon tax, and now, as the Ontario Liberal leader, she continues to side with her federal buddies on this punitive and aggressive carbon tax. The last thing people, really, last thing people need right now, Speaker, is another expense on their bills. Ontarians cannot afford the carbon tax, and they cannot afford the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the liberal taxes are killing businesses and draining Ontario families' household budgets? Minister of Energy. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again to the member from Milton. It's no surprise to anybody from coast to coast in our country, especially here in Ontario, the impact of the carbon tax, the federal carbon tax, which is fully supported by the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, is having on residents in our province. It's driving up the cost of everything from groceries to gasoline to home heating. Now, we've taken a different approach here under the leadership of Premier Ford and our team. We've cut taxes. We've cut fees. We're keeping energy costs low. You'll remember, not so long ago, when the Ontario Liberals were in power, our electricity bills tripled under their watch, Mr. Speaker, and it chased jobs out of our province by the thousands. 300,000 jobs left our province. Now, this morning, I was astonished to hear 
that Mr. Green and Mrs. Green and the Liberals and the NDP. Okay, I'm, I'm sick of that. We're going to start referring to members by their riding name or their ministerial title. The member from 12th and the member from Kitchener Centre were out in full support of the Green Energy Act, Mr. Speaker, which drove up the cost of electricity, tripling it. They want to go back there. And we know what will happen if the Liberals were ever, God forbid, to Response. come into power. They would do the same thing to our energy sector. We're keeping energy Thank you. Forward. Take your seat. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In Toronto, 523 people died from opioid overdoses. Toronto's public health officer, Dr. Eileen de Villa, had this to say. Overdose is more than a public health issue. It is a human tragedy that requires a response filled with empathy, care and compassion. Experts are calling on this government to take an effective and evidence-based approach to addressing the opioid crisis, an approach that includes harm reduction, overdose prevention, along with housing, health care and mental health support. My question is to the Premier. How many more people have to die before this government properly addresses our opioid crisis? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government is the first government to have in place a ministry responsible for mental health and addictions because we take opioids and all addictions very seriously. Our government is the first government to make investments of $525 million annually over, and, and $3.8 billion over 10 years and build a system of care. And if you listen and look at the roadmap to wellness, you'll see that there is a continuum of care that's being built throughout the province of Ontario to ensure that people are able to access services where and when they need them. That means giving them treatment, low barrier access to withdrawal management, accessing those services through mobile crisis response teams, through paramedicine that is now being incorporated into that continuum of care, and giving people after withdrawal management the opportunity to get into treatment, and with that treatment then reintegrate with social supportive housing. Mr. Speaker, we are building response. a system of care and ensuring that everyone is getting the treatment when and where they need it. Here, here. The supplementary question. Back to the minister. People are not getting the treatment that they need. 523 people died of an overdose addiction in Toronto last year alone. That is 523 people too many. My riding has been very hard hit by the opioid crisis. The neighbourhood group in University Rosedale has a memorial board of over 25 people in the community who have died from overdoses. People like Patty a staff person who worked hard to save people in the community. These people have family, they have friends, they contributed to the community, they are loved. These are preventable deaths, Minister. This is my question. What and when will this government take meaningful action to stop people needlessly dying? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Mr. Speaker, once again, I have visited your community and I visited pretty well every community in the province of Ontario to understand the specific needs of those different communities. And Mr. Speaker, we are building a system of care that's community-based, that meets the person where they are, and we are assisting everyone. Even a single death is one death too many. And I take those deaths very, very seriously and make sure that we do build these continuums. We've invested in opening over 400 beds at 7,000 treatment spots that didn't exist before this government came to power. And we're going to continue building a system of care and meeting people where they are. But we're not only looking after the individuals that we know are in greatest need in marginalized communities with investments in the black community, in indigenous communities, in remote commu communities, in rural communities. Response. We're building a mobile crisis, uh, a mobile health units that are moving around the province as well to assist wherever we can and meeting people and giving them the supports they need regardless of Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. All seniors in Ontario deserve to be treated with dignity and to receive the quality of care they need. Speaker, the previous Liberal government failed to invest in long-term care facilities and services. This led to unnecessary hospitalizations and, in some cases, 
force seniors to move to a long-term care home outside their community. Now the provincial Liberals are supporting a tax that is burdening existing long-term care homes with higher costs of operation while making it more expensive to build new homes. Speaker, our government remains focused on helping seniors get the right care in the right place. We're building more homes faster, and we won't stop calling on the federal Liberals to scrap the punitive carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how our government is improving long-term care for seniors despite facing challenges from the Liberal carbon tax? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, thanks to the amazing member from Burlington. And I, I've got to thank you for all your hard work, yes. But, Speaker, I've got to say, uh, very honestly, I, I absolutely hate talking about the carbon tax. And, you know, I'll tell you why. You see, the Liberals over there groan. And we groan every time we talk about it, too, but we groan for different reasons. Now, we groan because, as the member stated, this has made it very difficult to build long-term care in Ontario. They groan because they are sick of hearing of the carbon tax and refuse to do anything about it. In fact, Bonnie Crombie doubles down, stays silent when the federal Liberals triple this tax. And what does that result in? Higher construction costs, higher operating costs for long-term care in this province. Speaker, when will the Liberals finally do the right thing, stand up to Bonnie Crombie, stand up to Justin Trudeau, and say, get rid of this tax, it's costing our seniors in Ontario? Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the response. It's shameful that for over a decade, the previous Liberal government neglected this sector. Now, rather than supporting the people of Ontario, they're throwing their support behind a tax that makes life more unaffordable for Ontarians. As Premier Ford has warned since day one, the carbon tax is raising the cost of everything. Speaker, at a time when families are already struggling to make ends meet, it's unfair and unjust for the Liberals to keep hiking the carbon tax just like they did on April 1st. Unlike the Liberals, our government will continue to speak up for Ontarians, continue to fight for our seniors, and continue to deliver real affordability. Speaker, can the Minister tell the House what our government is doing to combat the negative effects of carbon tax that have on our long-term care sector? Mr. of Long-Term Care. So, Speaker, we're, we're doing a lot, and we were doing that before the pandemic hit. We were doing that after the carbon tax was tripled and, and keeps going up, Speaker. And what are we talking about? Well, in the latest budget, what did we do? We introduced another $155 million for construction funding subsidy to offset those increased costs, but we also did more. We increased to the highest level ever $353 million for a 6.6 per cent increase to operational costs. Why, Speaker? Because long-term care homes are paying more for everything, to transport food to the homes, to transport seniors, to transport uh, food itself, to transport equipment itself, Speaker. But we went further, a one-time $202 million funding, $2,543 per space in every single one of these members' ridings to offset those increased costs, the pressures associated with the carbon tax. Now, I wish we didn't Response. have to do that, because that could go to better outcomes for seniors. Stand with us, stand with our seniors, say no to the carbon tax. I am, I am standing, I'll say to the minister, and I'll ask again the members to make their comments through the chair, not, a, not across the floor of the House like that. Start the clock. The member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Health. Today I'm asking for support for a constituent of mine, a constituent of mine Noor Aisha. Noor has a rare form of cancer and her doctors have told her it can only be treated by a drug named Pemazire. The drug is approved by Health Canada, Quebec and other provinces are close to funding the drug, and it is the standard of care in the United States, United Kingdom and China, yet not covered here. Noor's family applied for funding under the CBCRP program but were denied. Speaker, having access to this treatment could mean more time for Noor to spend with her 18-month-old daughter. So my question for the minister, with Noor's doctors and experts asking for approval, why are Noor and others with this rare cancer being denied access to this life-saving drug? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. 
Thank you, Speaker. You know, I'm happy to look into the individual case, but I will say that Ontario has led Canadian uh, provinces and territories when Health Canada receives and gives approval for new drugs and new therapies, uh, when it goes through the PCPA pricing process uh, and when there is an assessment on when the drugs are appropriately used in the populations. Um, Ontario actually leads Canada in getting it on the drug formulary and making sure that we have access here in Ontario. The supplementary question. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your attention to this and I know it means a lot to Noor and her family. Again, to the Minister of Health, while some drugs save lives, there are others that have no place in our ORs. For example, desflurane, also known as DES, is an anesthetic gas that is being banned in jurisdictions across the world and in Canada because of its negative environmental impact and the availability of more cost-effective alternatives. Several hospitals in Ontario have banned this gas. Health Sciences North in Sudbury saved $250,000 last year, and Trillium Health in Mississauga saved $125,000 last year, all while slashing emissions. My question for the Minister of Health, will you take an important step today, ban desflurane, and save hospitals thousands of dollars, cut emissions, while also ensuring good patient outcomes? Minister of Health. No, I want to go back to the uh, member's original question and highlight some of the drugs that actually Ontario was the first to list. Trikafta, of course, for cystic fibrosis being the one that comes to mind immediately. You know, the uh, member opposite is inserting herself and her party into clinical decisions that should best be left to clinicians and to hospital leadership, and I will continue to let them lead. Thank you, Speaker. Next question. Yeah. The member from James Bay. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question goes to the long-term care minister. In a survey, we saw that there were 60, 60 rooms for 2025, but it has not happened. This private company does not prioritize constructions and they will not build even though they receive subvention of, from the government. We talk about a two-year wasting list for long-term care. Mr. Minister, uh, are you going to prepare the 68 lead bed in Kapuskisen as promised? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question from the member opposite. I have received uh, your letters. Uh, requesting an update on this project in Kapuskasing, because Kapuskasing, like everywhere else across this province, has a similar problem. And that problem is that we have a shortage of long-term care spaces in Ontario. Now, that, that has been a problem that's been de developing for a long time. Now, this government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, came along in 2018 and said, we're changing that. $10 billion, biggest capital expansion ever into long-term care, 58,000 new and upgraded spaces. Until this point, 18,200 homes built or with shovels in the ground, and more to follow. Now, the Speaker asks about the 68 allocated to cap casing, and our message to extend to care is very clear. You have an allocation. We expect you to get shovels in the ground. We are here to help support that. As I said, we will be reaching out to the company as well to make sure that that is uh, followed through on. Uh, but I appreciate that the member understands the similar problem that we face across this province, that seniors took care of us. It is our turn to take care of them. Let's build these homes. Supplementary question. Extended care for an extension. Long-term care wants an extension and they want to have less responsibilities. The government promised 23,000 long-term care beds by 2025. Are you going to extend the contract and are going to assign this contract to partners who are willing to build? Our citizens are waiting out there, um, we expect you to build. Let's make that very, very clear. And we have put supports out there for that end. 
Now, what supports are we talking about, Speaker? In the latest budget passed by our fine finance ministry just a few short months ago, $155 million for construction funding subsidy in those tough and expensive to build areas. But we went further, Speaker. 6.6% increase to level of care funding. That's operational support for things like staffing, for food, for, for residents. We went even further. $200 million one time funding for deferred maintenance, for capital costs. Now, these are all of these supports are meant to make it easier to get shovels in the ground. We understand the pandemic presented challenges. We understand the neglect by the Liberals presented challenges to long-term care. We are going to get over those hurdles, and my message to extend to care once again is clear. Get shovels in the ground. Let's get these built in capital casing. In fact, let's get this built all over our great province. Fun. We owe it to our seniors. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you. Speaker, my question is for the Solicitor General. It is clear to everyone, but the federal government and their provincial bodies, that the Liberal carbon tax is hurting Ontario's economy. As the Liberal imposes one tax hike after another, it is costing more for a police cruiser, fire truck, or an ambulance to fill up their tank. Speaker, individuals and families across Ontario rely on police and firefighters to keep their communities safe. It's imperative our first responders have the resources they need to do their job. The carbon tax is impacting the very institutions that provide essential services for Ontarians. Question. We need the federal provincial liberals uh, federal liberals to listen and remove this tax. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please tell the House how our government is ensuring Ontario's safety by fighting against the carbon tax? The Solicitor General. Well thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member uh, for the question and for the great work he's doing in Scarborough Agent. Mr. Speaker, last week I had the privilege of going down to Windsor and meeting with Fire Chief Stephen LaForette. And I spoke with him on the amazing work he's doing, and I want to congratulate the member from Windsor Tecumseh for representing his community with a concern for public safety. It is absolutely undeniable. Bonnie Crombie, as mayor of Mississauga, mm -hmm. saw the fire department bill for carbon tax as part of the fire department budget for Mississauga Fire. And you know what? She approved it. She approved what? it with the line for carbon tax. carbon tax. She was wrong for Mississauga. She was wrong for not saying she knew what was going on with the bill for carbon tax. And she's wrong for Ontario. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Solicitor General for the response. The public safety of Ontarians is paramount importance. Speaker, what, that's why we are calling for the removal of tax that only added more obstacles for the frontline workers that keep our communities safe. But, the Speaker, the same cannot be said for the NDP and the Liberal members in this legislature. They continue to ignore the harmful effect the carbon tax has on our day-to-day -day lives. Speaker, unlike the opposition members, our government is standing firmly behind our first responders. We won't stop fighting until this tax is abolished. Speaker, Question. can the Solicitor General tell the House why the federal government must scrap the tax. Solicitor General. Well, it's simple, Mr. Speaker. Every dollar to fuel a vehicle in public safety, and public safety is very important to this government. It's important to Premier Ford morning, noon, and night, and it's important to this government. And, Mr. Speaker, when you look at the numbers, 18 cents per litre for gasoline 
is just the carbon tax portion. And if you look at the fact that an average SUV for public safety is 100 litres, you multiply it per year, it's a minimum of $6,500. When I met with Chief Jason Belair also last week in Windsor, great police service that keeps Windsor safe, the, 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 the chief told me that the bill for their fuel is almost a million dollars. That means dollars. with the carbon tax portion, they could put another constable on the road to keep Windsor safe. Bonnie Crump, let her... Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Kitchener Centre has given notice of their dissatisfaction with the answer to their question given by the Minister of Health regarding desflurane. This matter will be debated today following private members' public business. Point of order, the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do want to welcome with us Pat Dealey, along with his beautiful family who's with us, Carol, Michael, Kyle, Monica, and Robin. Pat has served for 39 years as a school board trustee, of which 31 years as the chair of his school board, and uh, the last six as president of the Ontario Catholic Trustees Association. This man is a leader in Ontario. He's joined by the Bishop of Hamilton, Bishop Crosby. I want to welcome you and Lorena and Nick and Anne and your family, and thank you for your leadership for the people of Ontario. And the member for Nickel Belt has a point of order. Very quickly, just uh, like to invite everybody to Diabetes Canada. They're in 2.30 today, and they would like to see as many of you as possible. Thank you. Point of order. Does that mean you have a point of order? <laughs> member for Toronto Centre. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. I would like to invite all members of the House to join us at the ceremonial flag polls uh, today at 12 o'clock for the, the raising of the pride flag. Thank you very much. There will be, a, I, I should also comment, there, should be a, there will be a provision of a celebratory lunch as well as the, uh, the choir, the live performance from Singing Out, uh, Canada's largest 2SLPT choir. Uh, they'll be here with us today. Thank you. a former member who served in the 41st Parliament, Glenn Tebow, member for Sudbury. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Being no further business at this time. I'm going to say this once again. If a member has a point of order and wants to raise a point of order, I need them to say so. <laughs> point of order, I recognize the member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Thank you. Just want to let members know that Disability Without Poverty also has a reception at noon today, so there are many places to visit over the noon hour today. Hope you can make it. <laughs> Would you like a cup of coffee? or? <laughs> Okay, the member for Meshkigawak, James Bay, I believe, on a point of order. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I can see in the gallery that my intern is here, Catherine Gallen. He's going to end his term soon. My assistant is also here. She's also going to work elsewhere soon. Thank you very much for all your services and for the work you provided for the House. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. For being Merci. Il n'y a pas d'autre affaire à voir, donc nous allons prendre une pause jusqu'à 15 heures.